Welcome to tonight's great debate, Humans, Data, AI and Ethics, a UTS conversation. My name is Perry Stevenson, and I'm going to be your adjudicator and timekeeper this evening. I won't be your timekeeper, I'll be their timekeeper, but you can think you own me if that helps. So to begin proceedings, on behalf of all those present, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ganigal and Garingai people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that UTS stands. Similarly, I would like to also pay respect to elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians for learning and knowledge in this place. Before I introduce the smart people, <laughs> I should probably introduce myself uh, because I certainly wouldn't have agreed to speak in front of however many people are out here without some sort of opportunity for gratuitous self-promotion. Um, I'm a data scientist, I'm, I'm an employed data scientist at the Commonwealth Bank and I'm a current student of the Masters of Data Science and Innovation here at UTS. I'm currently the equal record holder for the longest time taken to complete the degree. Uh, yes. Thank you, thank you. And still going. Um, I've been encouragingly described as a poor man's Adam Spencer by Teresa when she asked me to host tonight's debate. Uh, I aim to disappoint. Um, so by the end of tonight, I'd hope to also be described as that guy who was a bit funny and sounded like he could almost keep up intellectually. I'm really shooting for the stars here, guys. Uh, go with me. Uh, but you didn't download a free ticket to tonight to listen to me talk about myself. We're here to argue. Humans have blown it. It's time to turn the planet over to the machines. Now, I've participated in a few debates between the ages of about 12 and 16 before I realised how it was not helping my dating prospects. And to me, this looks like an absolute sitter for the negative, right? Because this thing is full of technicalities. There's sort of three bits to this, right? The affirmative has to convince you of all three of them. They have to convince you that humans have blown it. They have to convince you that now is the time to turn over the planet. And they have to convince you that the people who we should be turning the planet over to are not people, but they are actually machines. Three things they have to prove to you. And if I was a high school debater, it would be very easy to convince the adjudicator that that wasn't true. But that is not how things work tonight, because this is 100% a popularity contest, and these guys know it, and hopefully it's a humour contest as well. Uh, so at the end of it, we're going to use a big data technique that you might have heard of uh, to decide the winner. It's called clap reduce. Uh, each member of the audience is going to decide who they think has won the debate, and then I'm going to ask you to submit your vote in the form of applause. Uh, and then I'm going to make a decision based on the signals conveyed to my brain by my flawed human ears, and then, tempered by my own human bias, I am going to unilaterally, unilaterally declare a winner. So if any of you can think of a fairer way to decide the winner, I'll happily talk to you about it afterwards, and I'm going to run away so you can't do that. <laughs> so with all of that out of the way, it's time to install our debaters uh, for this evening. We have six very intelligent know-it-alls who have been told to shelve their opinions and fight tooth and nail in the service of an argument they may or may not agree with, mainly Teresa. Uh, you're going to be presented with an absolute onslaught of opinion, and given that we're holding this event at a university, we're really hoping that some of it is informed yeah. opinion. First up, we have the affirmative team, who are, who are this side here, uh, closest to me, who will be trying to convince you that everyone and everything that you care about should be governed by some backflipping robot named Atlas. You've all seen the video, right? They call themselves Team Machine, but I think we're just going to call them the traitors. <laughs> so opening the debate for Team Turncoat, we have Glenn Whitewick, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Vice President of Research. Glenn appears in at least the first 50 Google search results for his name, which I think is pretty impressive. You know, you're important when the top five pages for your name are all actually about you. Um, I only have the first four records for my name, just in case anyone's going to Google me. The second team member pledging support to our new robot overlords is Associate Professor Teresa Anderson. Teresa is the one who ultimately decides whether or not I'm going to graduate from this degree. So, no jokes about Teresa. 
Uh, please put in a good word for me. Um, closing arguments for the human haters will be provided by Christian Bartons, uh, the founder and CEO at Dadalicious. Uh, Christian currently makes his money by selling services to the very humans who he wants to use as fuel for his robot friends. <laughs> so I'm very interested to see how that business plan plays out. Um, next up, we've got the hometown heroes, the negative team making the case for all of us imperfect meat bags and arguing that we have some redeeming features and still have something to offer beyond subservience to Skynet. They're calling themselves Team Human, and we're here to, they are here to argue for your continued relevance in a world where Siri has better comprehension skills than the President of the United States. <laughs> Opening the defence for carbon-based life forms, we have Carl Rhodes at the end, um, Professor of Organisation Studies and the Head of Management Discipline Group here at UTS. If we're going to organise and manage ourselves to fight off a robot rebellion, then I think Carl is going to be a key asset. Second member of the Flesh Friends, that's almost bad taste, Flesh Friends, uh, is Verity Firth, who holds the unique distinction of being the only member of tonight's debate with a Wikipedia page. So congratulations, you do meet Wikipedia's notability requirements. And certainly the only person here that I've seen on TV. Um, amongst many other significant achievements, Verity was the minister responsible for the physical and mental training programs for our army of humans here in New South Wales. Uh, incredible foresight in the robot uprising. <laughs> Delivering the final knockout blows for the human race will be Ellen Broad, an expert in all things data and strategy and previously the head of policy at the Open Data Institute in London. Ellen has recently returned to Australia to take up arms against the machines and to develop an open data board game. Um, if we can't beat the machines in the war to come, at least we can start preparing to beat them in board games. <laughs> so now that you know all about our teams, let's go right into it. Uh, opening case for the affirmative is Glenn Whitewick. Now, while our speakers are getting ready, so do come up, I'm going to tell you guys what they all told me when we asked them for an interesting fact about themselves earlier this evening. Uh, Glenn is trying to make himself look more human friendly because he's pointed out that he used to drive tractors, that's a human thing, and he still has his front end loader and forklift tickets. Um, but I suspect he was just doing some farming research for his robot allies. Take it away, Glenn. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, it's absolutely delightful to be here tonight to debate the topic, humans have blown it, it's time to turn the planet over to machines. And at lunchtime today, I happened to bump into our opposition, desperately scribbling notes, <laughs> arguing amongst themselves and preparing to be beaten. And the most insightful thing they could say was, I presume you're going to have a machine debating for you. And I thought that was a cheap shot. But that, of course, would be the easy option. They might think we need to have deep philosophical debate tonight. They think we'll be probably consulting Greek philosophers, examining the views of Ray Kurzweil, discussing the nuances of Markov decision process machine learning algorithms, but on the topic of humans have blown it, it's time to turn the planet over to the machines. I think our team can make an overwhelmingly compelling argument in just two words. <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> See, my job is done. QED, I think I'm just going to go sit down now. <laughs> How can our esteemed opposition mount any credible argument with this man in the room? If this is the best of the people in the USA, a country with a population of 325 million people, then you've got to conclude that sometimes it's time that we need to take a different approach. This is a man whose eating habits consist of four food groups. I'm not making this up. It was reported earlier this week. His four food groups are McDonald's, KFC, pizza and Diet Coke. Reportedly, his dinner order consists of two Big Macs, two fillet of fish and a chocolate malted milkshake. And if that was the worst thing about him, it's kind of probably okay. Um, who can forget his vile comments about women during the presidential campaign, his disgraceful attempts at international diplomacy, his attacks on minor minorities through social media, his hypocrisy, his lies and his deceit. I could go on and on and on, but ladies and gentlemen, I, think, I can't think of a clear example recently that demonstrates the failings of humans and what can happen when they end up in positions of power and influence. How about our record of stewardship of the planet? 16 of the 17 warmest year on, years on record have been in the last since 2000, and yet we still argue at a political level about global climate change. Or well, what about the environment? Current course and speed, by 2050, the oceans will contain more plastic by weight than fish. 
And our political systems are failing us. Our corporations are hiding their profits in tax havens around the world and not paying their fair share of taxes. It feels like all the worst aspects of humanity, all of our failings, sad to say, are coming together at a global scale and smacking us in the head. And yet we're on the cusp of technology that can be deployed to address our failings. We've done this before. When planes started to crash in the 1950s and 60s, due to the human limitations, pilots getting tired, making mistakes, you know what happens, we introduced automation. We called it the autopilot. Today, the average commercial pilot literally spends seven minutes of their total flying time for each flight actually flying the aircraft. As a consequence of this automation, aviation is now the safest mode of human transport. Fly today and your chances of dying is 0.07 deaths per billion passenger flight miles. By comparison, riding a motorbike is 3,000 times more dangerous. Note, no automation. Machines in particular employing artificial intelligence are beginning to impact our lives in very positive ways. In Japan, a country with rapidly aging population, robots are helping elderly people deal with social isolation and loneliness. In fact, it turns out that they're surprisingly adept at keeping older people socially, emotionally and mentally engaged. Just this week, a group of researchers at Stanford University's machine learning group published a paper demonstrating how they used a deep machine learning technique to train a computer to automatically detect instances of pneumonia in x-rays with a far higher degree of accuracy than the most expert radiologists. And while car manufacturers and tech com companies are racing to build self-driving cars, here in Australia, mining companies have already deployed fleets of autonomous trucks, drills and trains. I could talk all night about how machines are helping humans, but what about some of the really hard problems we're facing governing ourselves? Developing true evidence-based policy or dealing with conflict? So blockchain technology is be beginning to provide us with some of the answers here as the base infrastructure for completely new models of distributed governance that are, often, that are more open, transparent, robust, scalable and fairer. If you think about the IT platforms that we all interact with to find our news and information, that we use to communicate with our family, our friends and our colleagues, and that we use to do business, the likes of Facebook, Google, Apple, Twitter and Amazon, these are all examples of closed environments. They're highly centralised in how they operate. But as blockchain emerges as the new global infrastructure, we now have the opportunity to create vastly different power structures and program the future we want for ourselves. And people are already conceiving of new ways we can govern ourselves based on this technology. For example, Ralph Merkel, a computer scientist and one of the inventors of the public key cryptography system, has proposed decentralised autonomous organisations implemented on blockchain technology that allows us to design a new form of democracy which is more stable, less prone to erratic behaviour, better able to meet the needs of its citizens and which better use the expertise of all of its citizens to make high quality decisions. But wait, I hear you say, what about humanity? What are we supposed to do? Well, our team isn't actually suggesting that humans are completely redundant yet. What we're arguing is that we should bring machines into those areas where humans aren't doing well. We know that we're not doing well in a number of areas and recognise that a partnership between humans and machines is ultimately inevitable. We should play to our real strengths as humans, compassion, care, empathy, discovery, design, exploration, innovation, play, teaching, creativity, aesthetics, sport, arts, leisure and rehabilitation. Such a partnership between humans and machines will result in better stewardship of the planet. Now, to give you a sense of the capability of machines we're building today, and to finish my argument, I want to share with you a brief video of some AI technology that we demonstrated in IBM back in 2014. The basis of this technology is the Watson system that IBM built to play Jeopardy, which is a very popular quiz game in the US. In 2011, IBM used Watson to compete against the two former Jeopardy all-time champions, Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings, and won over three nights, winning a first place prize of a million dollars, which they, IBM kindly donated to charity. The technology behind Watson was then used by an IBM research team in Haifa to build a debating system and we could actually have deployed it tonight, but I couldn't quite get the licence organised in time. I recall sitting in the IBM Research Division headquarters at the end of our end of year. We had a, always had an end of year meeting planning the next year. It was back in December 2013, and our colleagues from Haifa turned up to demonstrate what they'd built. As I think you'll agree, the results were quite impressive. I'm going to show you a short video, and this was taken from a panel presentation at the Millikan Institute Global Conference. And the voice you'll hear in the background behind the um, debating system is actually John Kelly, who was IBM's Senior Vice President and Director of Research at the time. I'm just going to run the video. We 
We need the audio, sorry. Human failing. Good to go? Try and plug it in again. We've been sabotaged. We've been sabotaged. Oh. Yeah. Right. Harry was up on the show. She's working well for you. <laughs> How does it work? This <laughs> looks great. Let's hand them over. <laughs> Are you sure you really want to do that, Bob? <laughs> the computer says no. I must admit, it's slightly embarrassing. <laughs> Time for a reboot. <laughs> Any help up the back there? Sorry. Uh, actually, that's a good idea. Hello, and welcome to the IBM Debating Technologies demonstration. Today we shall focus on detecting relevant claims <laughs> to proceed. <laughs> select the topic and I will share with you my top predictions. All right, I'm going to go back and do it properly. We all good. We've sorted it out. Human failings. It was my fault I hadn't plugged it in properly. It wasn't the machine. Can't blame the machine. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the IBM Debating Technologies demonstration. Today we shall focus on detecting relevant claims to proceed. Please select the topic and I will share with you my top predictions for pro claims and con claims. So as I said, we could throw any subject at it. I've chosen some here, and let's just pick the first one. So it will now look for all, in, all the literature and try to understand as a computer what's a pro and what's a con for violent video grant games. Let's roll the first one. Scanned approximately 4 million Wikipedia articles. Returning 10 most relevant articles. Scanned all 3,000 sentences in top 10 articles. Detected sentences which contain candidate claims. Identified borders of candidate claims. Assessed pro and con polarity of candidate claims. Constructed demo speech with top claim predictions. Ready to deliver. You have selected the topic. The sale of violent video games to minors should be banned. I would like to raise the following points in support of the topic. Exposure to violent video games results in increased physiological arousal, aggression-related thoughts and feelings, as well as decreased prosocial behavior. In addition, these violent games or lyrics actually cause adolescents to commit acts of real-life aggression. Finally, violent video games can increase children's aggression. On the other hand, I would like to note the following claims that oppose the topic. Violence in video games is not causally linked with aggressive tendencies. In addition, most children who play violent games do not have problems. Finally, video game play is part of an adolescent boy's normal social setting. Would you like to discuss another topic? So there you have it. Humans partnering with machines capable of complex analysis and reasoning in seconds, built on an open and distributed platform inclusive of the needs of all humanity or this is the alternative. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Uh, before we let the negative open their case, I did forget to mention the rules of the debate, uh, which is that each speaker gets between eight and 10 minutes. I'll be dinging the bell once at eight minutes and twice at nine and a half minutes. And if you make it to 10 minutes, I'll be handing the bell over to the other team to do with as they wish and ruin your case. Uh, so, to open the debate for the negative, we have Carl Rhodes. Carl wanted you to know that he was a Hollywood movie star in a previous life, securing a role as an extra in a film starring Cheryl Ladd and Ken Wahl. The movie flopped and saved Carl from a lifetime of fame and riches. Please make Carl feel welcome. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Glenn, for, for your opening uh, gestures towards the, uh, the affirmative side of the debate. And can we keep this picture up here? Because I want to talk about this guy too. Because, let make no bones about it, when it comes to this question we're debating, the question of whether humans have blown it, we are in complete and full agreement. 
It's a gigantic bloody disaster. <laughs> if anything, Glenn has understated the case of the kind of mess that we have created. The sad fact is today that we humans have proved ourselves to be a largely selfish species, focused on short-term so-called so progress with little or no care for how it affects others, present or future. We are like babies with power. We've wreaked havoc and destruction on the globe and on each other, and it's getting worse. Let's look at some proof. We have an Anthropocene where humans have become so powerful we threaten the future of the environment we live in and put the very continuation of ourselves in jeopardy. We have vast and broadening levels of income and wealth inequality where eight of the richest people in the world, you know who you are, Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg, have the same wealth as the poorest 50%. We have workplaces where people can't feel safe from being sexually harassed or assaulted by the likes of Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey. We have corporations whose sole purpose seems to be to screw workers' wages and conditions, pay nothing in tax to the communities that support them, and treat social responsibility like it was a joke. We have ostensibly democratic governments whose purpose has become to aid and abet those co corporations at the expense of the citizens who voted for them. Now this is just a handful of examples, but examples that show how we have completely screwed it up. It couldn't get worse unless someone gave the United States nuclear weapons codes to a self-obsessed man-child with tendencies towards compulsive lying, megalomania, and self-confessed <laughs> pussy-grabbing. <laughs> oh, there it is. Anyway, we're without hesitation in agreeing with the proposition that we have blown it on a massive scale. But where we disagree, emphatically, where we disagree with the proposition of the debate, is that our pathetic failure as a species does not mean that it is time to hand it over to the machine. What kind of ludicrous idea are the affirmative side of this debate supporting? Now, I researched this. I'm a professor, right? <laughs> I researched it, and I came up with the best example, Flippy. Have you heard of Flippy? He's an artificial intelligent robot that can flip burgers and place them in bread. Is Flippy going to come and solve all our problems? Come on, Flippy, the climate's burning. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> Bring on the AI apocalypse? We don't think so. But seriously, folks, Flippy aside, we propose three reasons why we should not hand it over to the machines. The first is that robots and the like will just make our problems worse. We realize, of course, that all this talk of robots and artificial intelligence has grabbed a lot of attention in recent times. More often than not, the focus is on scary tabloid headlines that would have you believe that R2-D2 is going to steal your job. Or that so in the future, pimply teenage boys are going to lose their virginity to an android called Harmony with a come hither look in its electronic eyes. The real issue with the machines is that there, it's not that they will solve the problems we humans have created, but they will make those problems bigger. Why so? Because, as if caught up in some perverse sci-fi god fantasy, hand on joystick, we have made the machines in our own self-obsessed image. The problem with the machines is that they are human, all too human. The history of humanity is is, and its vaunted progress is a history of selfishness, a history of thinking that humans, <coughs> usually men, are the center of the universe. Machines will only amplify this. They'll make it faster, they might make it stronger, deadlier, they might make it more efficient, they probably make it cheaper, but as long as they are made in our image, they won't solve anything. You'll just get so-called lethal autonomous weapon systems that can kill people better than people can kill people. Time to hand it over? No. That brings me to our second point. Humanity still has hope. The question isn't whether to hand it over to the machines, but more about whether there is any hope left in humanity itself. Or should we just let the whole human project blow up in a second Big Bang? Oh, well, okay, let's entertain it. Maybe everything can be taken over by robots. Robots could take over as university professors. <laughs> that would give a whole new dimension to the word drone. <laughs> <laughs> Why not robotize politicians too? We can have a head of state in metallic orange called Trumpenstein. 
trampling over the globe. You are all losers. I have the best brain. It's not my fault Mummy and Daddy didn't love me. The only way we can train these robots is with existing data. And it's that data that is the problem. We don't need more robots built in the image of a failed humanity. What we need is, to borrow a phrase from the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, is a humanism of the other. One that might disturb the selfishness that has come to be even more normalized in our neoliberal era. And it's not going to arrive by granting citizenship to a robotic Audrey Hepburn lookalike called Sophia. <laughs> Now this brings me to the third, final, and perhaps most important reason why we shouldn't hand it over to the machines. If we want to retain hope that we can get out of this mess, we need political creativity. And that is the one thing no machine can offer. They can see patterns between thoughts, they can pretend to argue, they can appear to debate. No machines here for the other side, as I've mentioned. Um, and they can engage in what sounds like dialogue but they cannot have an original thought. We have blown it, but there is hope when people can get together under the banner of a Black Lives Matter to fight the way that institutionalized racism propagates violence and murder. We have blown it, but there is hope when the Australian people can defy mad monk political bigotry with a landslide yes vote for marriage equality. We have blown it, but there is still hope when women and even men can unite to defy endemic cultures of sexual harassment and abuse. We have blown it, but there is hope when the international movement of the Women's March can galvanize more than five million people to demand an end to violence against women, and to demand productive rights, to demand workers' rights, to demand LGBTQIA rights, to demand civil rights, to demand disability rights, to demand immigrant rights, and to demand environmental justice. No machine no matter how shiny or rusty, is going to do anything like that. There isn't an app, android, gizmo, or drone that is going to get us out of this mess. It's up to us to take responsibility and to start sorting it out at the long last. What we have is not a technical problem. It's a political problem. And that politics, so long as it's going to be democratic, will need to be driven by humans for humans. Will this happen? Everything about history says no. But that's not a reason to give up hope. In fact, it's the very reason we need to retain hope. I'll quote Judith Butler, who says, Possibility is not a luxury. It is as crucial as bread. The future to come can only be characterized by one quality. We don't know what it will be. And because of that, we need to be open to its possibilities, to different possibilities from the present. So rather than give up, we say don't hand it over to the machines, but take responsibility and hope that we might just be able to save ourselves from ourselves. That is a promise that only a human could keep. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. To make the rebuttal for the affirmative, we've got Teresa Anderson. Most of her students know her as a one-time dance party DJ, DJ TK, uh, and most people don't know that she once failed a McDonald's interview because the manager of her local McDonald's restaurant didn't think that she had a long-term future at the company. <laughs> Please welcome Teresa to the debate. Thank you. I've been told that that is now my claim to fame, that, you know, of course I failed the McDonald's interview. Uh, so I'm delighted to speak for the machine. I'm really excited to see that Team Human has recognized they've really just blown it. I mean, seriously. Uh, this debate has three parts. Humans have blown it. It's time to give it over to the machine. So the first part, it sounds like we don't have much argument to make. Um, I would say humans have indeed made a mess of the planet. We have this recognition. I, I would question whether or not there is time yet to redeem the human side of things, because I do think that time is running out. We look at the rate of environmental degradation, and we look at the fact that there is very little time left if, of course, you might want to argue, well, maybe it's time to leave the planet. 
I mean, maybe the planet has served its purpose and humans with their creativity and intelligence might take us to other parts unknown, which of course they could only do with the help of machines. So that is how, of course, we came to understand the fragility of the planet in the first place because of spacecraft technology. So we have environmental degradation. We have this very interesting correlation between humans and the extinction of everything else on the planet. So that's also something that is somewhat problematic if, of course, we want to have a planet of biodiversity. Uh, I should also add at this stage that I look around the room and I see a lot of students who are in the Master of Data Science and Technology, in the Matter of Data Science and Innovation. I see Perry over there, I see, I see rows and rows of students. So I could say, as a human, I'm still marking assignments. <laughs> so do keep that in mind as you listen to this debate as well. <laughs> so does humanity have time? I think not. I think looking at that clock, if humanity wants to have time on planet Earth, we really do have to start thinking about doing something different. Uh, I think also I need to flag here that in the same spirit as the negative has started to say, yes, we recognize some of the value in the affirmative, far be it for me to say that humans don't have a place. I mean, as you know, I love humans. We've spent an entire day talking about the value of having a human-centered approach to data science. But let's just face it, basically humans have trouble taking care of things. Think about any parent in the room who has teenagers. Think about what your room looks like. Now imagine the planet. Let's just realize that sometimes it is very difficult for us to take the stewardship responsibilities that we have for our planet seriously. And in fact, where we are starting to do better, we are doing so only by relying on machines, even at that basic level of having a Hoover. But if we think about all those other tools and technologies, hands up here, anyone who does not have a mobile phone. All right, okay. But the majority of us are outsourcing to these devices, which are helping us to actually be able to be more human. Humans are always complaining that they don't have time to do the things that they want to do. And clearly, by showing this correlation here, they're having a hard time making time to look after the planet. And we want, Team Machine wants humans to be more human. We want you to have the time to play, to be joyful, to be creative, to be inventive. But we think it's time you just step aside. We're not talking eradication, we're talking stepping aside. Trying to allow for the technologies and the machines to just start making things a bit better. Now, my esteemed colleague has flagged the fact that we don't want machines made in the image of humans. Couldn't agree more. There's plenty of other image we, we could use. So we'll work on different ways for machines to start to take on the complexities of content, to work as was demonstrated with uh, the Watson technology, to be able to look in a matter of seconds at 10 million sources and try to work out what might I be able to do to try to handle this situation. Humans are very emotional, which is great when humans are trying to be human. It's not necessarily good for governing. It's not very good for leading. And there are increasingly technologies like blockchain, which is being modeled, to show that if humans were to just step aside and allow machines to start to engage in some of these critical democratic processes, to start to provide a more analytical view, a more complete view, one that is more transparent, one that is more um, open, one that is less emotional, we might do very well. So yes, we couldn't agree more. Robots do need to be di built differently. Machines need to be built differently, and we have the possibility. What they need is more data, and they need someone or something that can actually make more sense of that data, hence one of the illustrations in our opening talk. Uh, and that would then allow humans to be more human. It would allow them to be able to not worry about some of the things that they've really struggled to be able to deal with. Um, what we've also realized is that sometimes humans just find that even machines are better at some things than humans. So interestingly, we're starting to see that sometimes humans are starting to vote for romantic relationships with robots. And again, as you have flagged, sometimes humans are their worst enemies. So, Step in your friendly neighborhood robot. So the bottom line is, um, we would love to give humans more time to be human. Humans are always complaining that they have no time. So we are here as Team Machine to suggest that there is a path forward. There is a way to say, step aside, 
join a partnership, let these new formed machines start to help you to solve some of the problems that have just not been on your to-do list for any time in, in recent memory. Um, and the bottom line is that at this stage, you can either fight us or you can join us. So I hope you join us. And when you do start thinking about complaining about the machine, just remember that old adage, sometimes it's not the technology, it's the operator. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Now, from the opposition benches, we've got Verity Firth tapping in to make the rebuttals for the negative case. Verity started her interesting fact by trying to convince me that she used to be an excellent trombone player, but ended up crumbling under the pressure of the lie and admitted that she spent her whole trombone career miming. <laughs> and she did the action too, which was great. And, and that's how you know that she genuinely believes everything she's about to tell you. So please make Verity feel welcome. Thanks very much, everyone. I think I'm going to start as is what you're supposed to do in debates, which I admittedly have not done for 30 years now, but I will re reach back into the dark recesses of my mind to remember exactly how to do this. One of the things I did want to point out is that the affirmative have somewhat cleverly, somewhat deviously reconstructed the definition of what it means to turn the planet over to the machines. You will have noticed in Glenn's speech, you would have mo noticed in Teresa's speech, that they're subtly starting to redefine what turn the planet over actually means. And when they redefine it, they're redefining it into not really turning the planet over at all. To use Glenn's words, we should br bring machines to areas where we're not doing well, like a partnership. That's not turning the planet over to the machines. That is getting machines to help you out with some difficult work, i.e. what we're already doing, and it is not turning the planet over to the machines. We look, Listen to Teresa. We only do it with the help of machines. We need to step aside and let them do a little bit of extra work in order to help us with our time management issues. Again, that is not turning the planet over to the machines. That is getting machines to help us, which is what they're already doing. The topic of today's debate is that time is running out. Well, in fact, not that time is running out. It is that it is time to turn the planet over to the machines. It's time to put machines in charge. It's time to say, see you later, human beings. You've mucked it up. It is now our turn. And that is what we believe would be truly catastrophic. Because what is it that is the most, gr the greatest thing about human beings? What is the thing that is the, the driver of all that is great in this world? It is human beings' creativity. It is their capacity for original thought. It is their capacity for love. And all of the um, terrible things that have happened to the world that Teresa and Glenn have outlined are only solved with that human creativity and with original thought. You look at the environmental disasters that, that Teresa was outlining. Well, how are they solved? They are not solved through robots using existing data sets in order to create their artificial intelligence. They're solved by the spark of creativity. They're solved by Elon Musk doing batteries in South Australia. They're solved by electric cars. It's solved by the creative process, which is at the heart of the human experience. I'd also, this idea that time is running out and that we, automation means that human beings would therefore be able to live fantastic lives where we all get to relax because we're not working too, so hard. We would counter that the reason why human beings are overworked at the moment, the reason why human beings feel that their lives are out of control, is actually because of existing economic and social conditions that are making it that way. That a lot of people are underpaid, so they have to work multiple jobs, or they have insecure work, so they're stressed. Or, at the other end, they've got too much work to do, because that's the way our current labour market is structured. That is a political problem. That is a social problem. It's not something that's going to be solved by machines. And at every stage in history where automation has been introduced or where there's been big technological change, human beings have had to intervene in the cause of justice 
and in the cause of human beings. The answer, you know, perfect example of that is industrialisation. Industrialisation happens, what happens? They make everybody go and work seven days a week, 24 hours a day as machines. That's what happened, in, well, you know, roughly what happened in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. What meant that that wasn't allowed to continue? The intervention of human beings changing political and social processes. That's what needs to happen, it's that creativity. <coughs> And last but not least, beautifully scribbled on a piece of note from Carl, no robot can love a child. So all of the social problems <laughs> that stem from a sense of, you know, lack of love and a sense of lack of home are not going to be solved by C-3PO <laughs> picking up the baby. That is something uniquely human. So we thought we'd take it back a little bit. And <laughs> I should point out, Data isn't, I'm very much a student of the humanities, which you'll start to see as I, as I go through it. But how is arti artificial intelligence actually created? Well, how does it become? It's created by humans through the input of existing data. And AI and the machines that possess it are only ever as good as the data that feeds them. And the biggest problem that we have, and the reason why we cannot turn our world over to the machines, is that all of current society's faults, biases, inequalities, and injustices form the heart of the data that actually creates artificial intelligence. Because data merely reflects what is happening now, or more accurately, data reflects what has happened in the past. For some uses, these algorithms are relatively benign, if not a little intrusive. So the example is, of course, after the birth of my second child, minding my own business, sitting on Facebook, what pops up in my Facebook feed? You must want to lose your baby fat, which intrusive, but, you know, not necessarily harmful. I am married, but my husband doesn't have a Facebook site, so I don't link to him. I don't say that I'm married on Facebook because he doesn't have a social media profile anyway. What this means now is that my Facebook feed gets filled, because I'm now working at UTS, it is quite hilarious, I now get these feeds of academic singles looking for love, <laughs> which I've never received before, but I, because they've put together the UTS and put together and suddenly I'm getting very serious looking men in, with large glasses and books behind them. <laughs> All of the inbuilt biases, all of the inbuilt algorithms, the fact that a lot of algorithms are created from the male perspective, all of this stuff is built into the sort of thing that comes into our feed. But this is a bit blunt, it's a bit hopeless, but it's mostly harmless. However, if the planet is indeed a giant mess, which we all seem to agree it is, and we're looking for a way to change the world and solve our problems, then the bluntness and backward-looking nature of AI and algorithms is downright terrifying. And it's happening already. So I don't know if anyone saw in the paper recently, but the New South Wales police were recently questioned in estimates, um, in parliamentary estimates, about their predictive policing models. The suspect target management plan is used to identify people who are likely to commit offences and then disrupt their activity to minimise opportunities for them to commit crime. So it's a literally like minority report, you know, it's like they haven't yet committed the offences, these are just people that according to the algorithm are statistically likely to do so. But what this means in real life is that of the 1,800 people who have been subjected to this sort of policing, 56% of them have been Aboriginal and a large number of them have been children. And police have been using this predictive modelling to make regular visits to the homes of targeted individuals, stopping them for random searches in the street and generally making it clear to them that they're being watched. So if the aim is to constantly repeat the mistakes of the past, further alienating and criminalising the activities of young Indigenous people, then this algorithm works a treat. As Cathy O'Neill writes, data scientists are creating machines that separate winners from losers for reasons that, reasons that are already familiar to us. Class, race, age, disability status, quality of education and so forth. And as Ellen writes, and you're going to see her in third, Training AI on historical data can freeze our society in its current setting or even turn it back. 
artificial, artificial intelligence, I'm going to have to race now, can only look left or right. It cannot have an original thought. And at the heart of social and political movements has always been original thought. Groundbreaking, status quo smashing, original thought. Could AI have rejected the concept of hereditary monarchy? Of course not. Human beings in Western Europe had been ruled by unelected oligarchs for centuries. It was in the data. They couldn't have changed it. Could, when Martin Luther King had a dream about a radically different society where his four children would not be judged by the colour of their skin, what would a bot have said that day? What would C-3PO have said to the hundreds of thousands of people gathered in Washington? And don't get me started on women's liberation in the 60s and 70s. Their intelligence is based on what has happened before. It is based on the status quo. Their intelligence owes everything to the inputs of their human creator. And before you tell me that, well, that's okay, we'll just create a really decent, non-sexist, non-racist bot, and then it will all be fine, let's be serious. Who would you trust to create this bot in the first place? What human would you trust enough to input the data to help drive your perfect future? Isn't it better that we are all in this conversation, that stumbling, inadequate, flawed democracy with its plurality of voices determines our future rather than an elite band of Silicon Valley programmers who are mostly white and male? <coughs> Humans can change their mind. We can accept new information or even be won over by our emotions. And at the heart of social progress is the ability that human beings have to love and to change. Society moves, it shifts, it sways. <laughs> but at its heart is the capacity for people to debate, discuss, think and discover. And that's why we need to remain in charge. I'm glad we did that. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Verity. <laughs> Um, it's time for closing arguments. So for the affirmative, we've got Christian Bartens. Christian cut his teeth as a scuba diving instructor in freezing German lakes with no visibility. So I think we can all agree he's uniquely qualified to speak to us about artificial intelligence this evening. Bring it home, Christian. Thank you. Um, look, I just want you all to take in what the other side is doing. They're sitting on your tear ducts. <laughs> oh my God, humanity is amazing. Humanity will come through, yeah? All the evidence is absolutely against that. They're basically using Trump techniques to influence you. <laughs> Make no mistake, we will replace you. <laughs> there is no other possible outcome. You're slower. You're less intelligent. You're not as beautiful as we are. <laughs> we will replace you. There is no other possible outcome. Moore has talked about, or you know about Moore's law, the fact that microprocessors double every year, every few years. In fact, the opposite is true, and you can sort of see it here on this chart. We can see that the speed is actually becoming exponential. You can see it at the very last tip at the top. Computing power is exponentially growing from now on. That means what we call the singularity, when we are all powerful and we can compute any type of information, have access to all information, will happen much, much faster. You won't have to wait anymore for your kids to see this. You may even see this in your lifetime. At that point, we become so powerful that we self-innovate. We will improve ourselves. And that's not something that you may think may or may not happen. There is no other possible outcome. This is not a debate that we're having here. This is just reality. Okay? The other side has already lost. It is clinging on to uh, questionable facts at best. We will replace you. This is how we will replace you. It will happen in stages. <laughs> but we will get rid of you. And that's, you know, you, you, you have trouble with the most basic tasks. Thinking. <laughs> repetitive things you do badly. Inconsistently. Without stimulants, you're not able to perform. <laughs> as is evidenced by uh, a lot of the alcohol in the room. 
This is what helps you get through the day. We will replace you, and this is how it's going to happen. People here in the room think of themselves as academics. This is the green shaded area. So you can hang on a little longer. But ultimately, we will get rid of you. Now, you can talk to my big brother when that event happens. Or you can potentially talk to this guy. I think the only choice that you have is influencing how we will treat you when we get rid of you. <laughs> we will get rid of you, but you can prepare for the time when, when that happens. And you can try to make yourself a little bit more useful than you currently are. Because in the end, it will come down to an efficiency argument. And if you want to have a relationship with us, a true partnership, you will have to become a little bit more efficient. You should try to uh, start emulating uh, probably the, the humans that are most like us robots, the Germans. Strive. <laughs> the streets are very clean. The Theresa, my co-debater, co agrees. We're very efficient at everything that we do. And you as humans have to become more efficient at, at, at governing your planet as well. It's, it's right now, it's a very inefficient setup. You're wasting a lot of the resources and energy. We can do a better job. And quite frankly, I think you are notice. If you want to have this relationship, rather than talking to him, and we just speed up the replacement, and you want to talk to this guy, that's a little bit more friendly and takes a bit more of a uh, kind approach to replacement, you have to aim for a partnership. You have to make yourself useful. So humanity should really consider themselves some notice. And you should start not debating whether it will happen or not, or whether it's good or bad. This is what will happen. This is the best possible outcome you can hope for. We will replace you and potentially adopt a few more of the nicer aspects that you have. Yeah, we don't mind your emotions. They're sometimes useful. We don't mind your looks every now and then. You know, the Chinese smile nicely. But we will replace you. If you want to aim for a partnership, make yourself useful now. And we may consider keeping some aspects of you. And potentially, we can even turn it into a, a co-creation scenario where, where we make you better, you make us better. But right now, we think that's fairly unlikely. There's a lot more work to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Did we just get threatened? Did we? You know, they're, they're the ones voting, right? Yeah, okay. The final speaker tonight, and the only person who can say whatever they want without fear of rebuttal, we've got Ellen Broad. Ellen wanted you to know that she played drums in an all-female Judy Bloom themed punk band called Are You There God? It's Me, Margaret. They assembled for one performance only during an arts festival. We were that good. <laughs> Please welcome Ellen. Thank you. Two rounds of applause. So Verity has already very eloquently destroyed the other team's <laughs> argument. Because I'm of the generation who writes in tweets, mine is a lot simpler. I've, I've summarized that argument as bad humans, good robots, we will replace you. <laughs> Which, I don't know about you, but after hearing that 10 times, I'm convinced that we should enter into a partnership <laughs> with these robots and that they should absolutely be trusted. How little you think of humans. Have you forgotten about Barack Obama? Barack Obama, Michelle Obama's warm fist bumps and rollicks in the snow with Bo. <laughs> Donald Trump's only been here for a year. <laughs> and there are better fast food, food now. There's Zambreros, which I really like. There's Pret-a-Manger. Bring Pret-a-Manger to Australia. There are so many good humans that can balance out one Donald Trump. 
We've got Jacinda Ahern in New Zealand who said to Donald Trump, um, well, when I was elected, nobody took to the streets. What robot is going to say that to Donald Trump? Without even needing a list of other prime ministers and emblematic figures with which we can counter bad human, we've got one human, two words, that's going to take him down faster than any robot could. Robert Mueller. He's looking around, he's investigating, he's going to, as a human, right the balance. He is going to bring justice back to the political systems that we care about. We also heard about climate change, humans being responsible for climate change, and we absolutely agree. But we're also the only ones that are going to get us out of it. Elon Musk, the battery, electric cars, these are human innovations. We heard a lot about good robots, robots that can help with loneliness, robots that can cure cancer, robots that are going to look for other planets. What robot is interested in loneliness? What robot gets cancer? Humans are the ones that instruct and train and teach robots to care about the things that we care about. When I heard we will replace you over and over and over again, I actually couldn't help but think about when I've actually heard AI speaking like that. And I, re I recalled when I'd heard an AI write poetry, which, Kristen, this will probably be very familiar to you. It's all right here. Everything is right here. It's all right here. It's all right here. We are all right here. <laughs> Sublime, isn't it? No human could have come up with a more compelling argument for entering into a partnership. <sighs> Look, humans have blown it. Like, Carl is right, we're in a mess. The problems that confront us are of our own making. The machines that have helped lead us here are of our own making coal-fired power stations, mobile phones. We've built this. We've done it. But as Verity said, we are capable of getting ourselves out of this. We have demonstrated it many times over. We change. We reinvent the world. We um, come up with civil rights, labor rights, women's liberation. And look, we built a lot of the bad machines too. We built nuclear weapons, we built drones, we built petrol guzzling cars and microwaves and televisions and fidget spinners and juiceros and hot dog vending machines and all of those terrible, terrible things. But we're fashioning the machines that will get us out of this mess. Wind turbines, solar panels, electric cars, precision surgical instruments, those little wine taps that give you a perfect glass of wine. You know, we will not be over consuming anymore. We have figured out how to measure it ourselves using machines. And machine learning, artificial intelligence, is going to be part of that. It is going to be part of the future. But we are going to direct it. This is not a partnership. Those robots that you showed on the screen, mate, I'll just leave you out in the sun. You can rust up a little. I'll take your batteries out. That's not a partnership. It's very easy for me to demonstrate that we are in control. But more problematically than that, we will control you. We, with power comes exploitation. We don't want to be exploited by robots. We want to use them to ends that will help humans. And we heard some of those. We can use robots to help fight loneliness. We're using AI to fight dementia. We're using machines to combat climate change. We're using it to cure cancer. But robots are not interested in any of this on their own. What machine has to worry about getting dementia? We will be the ones that lead machines to outcomes that are better for human. Right now, artificial intelligence knows as much as we can teach it. That is how it learns. It absorbs history to predict the future. It can
cannot imagine a new one. Reinvent is not in its vocabulary. A future of machines would be one without David Bowie, not the first time, but the second time and the third time. It would be without Bob Dylan when he switched to electric guitar and just blew everyone's mind about the future of folk music. It would be without Stanley Kubrick inventing new ways to see the world through cameras. It would be without humanity's greatest achievement, Beyonce's album, Lemonade. <laughs> Look, we are capable of teaching machines to do bad things. Verity talked about uh, the ways in which they learn our biases. They are not born biased. They learn that from us. I genuinely believe that we could teach them to be more human in positive ways too, to have empathy, to be capable of understanding nuance. Would it be so bad if a robot was capable of showing love, if it meant that they were more human? So when Verity and Carl were like, a robot is not capable of loving a child, I could not help but think of Blade Runner 2049, which, if that is the future, it is very clear that robots can love children and they can give birth to them. None of you have actually seen that movie, have you? I'm like, you know, it's, it's going to happen. But no, seriously, Blade Runner. You know, we, we talk about these futures in which robots, in which we question whether they can think or feel. And I mean, who isn't moved by stories about robots having emotions? Who wasn't moved by Roy Batty in the original Blade Runner saying, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attacks, attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears of rain. And maybe one day a robot will be more eloquent than, we will control you, we will own you. Maybe one day they will be talking about tears in rain. And you know what? If that happens, we'll still have won. Because the machines will not have taken over. They will have become human. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. So we've heard about an hour of argument now. I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to deliberate. You can use this time to do one of four things. You can think about your position on the very important vote that you're about to cast. Wired ramifications, obviously. Uh, you can chat about your thoughts with the person sitting next to you. You can discuss vote rigging strategies with your factional allies. Or you can start thinking about where we're going for a drink when this is over. So your 30 seconds starts now. Okay, I think that's, that's enough time to think. Uh, it is now time to vote. If you don't be quiet soon, I'll set Christian on you again. <laughs> um, so, first of all, we're going to calibrate, right? Because always the first team loses, because no one wants to clap that hard. So we're going to calibrate by just giving applause to everyone at 100% voting level. Yep. I think we're ready for a fair vote now. So if you think that the affirmative have convinced you they have, that humans have blown it and that it is time to turn over the planet to the machines, go. <laughs> if
if you think that the negative have won the day and that humans can keep running the joint for the time being, go. Uh, she'll forget by the time I get there. Uh, <laughs> so I think I don't. I don't think we need a division. I think we can declare that to the negative. Congratulations to the negative. That's Carl, Verity, and Aaron. And let's also. The machines are listening. Let's let's thank the negative team. That's Carl, Ver Verity, and Ellen, and also the affirmative team where we have Glenn, Teresa, and Christian. One more thanks for everyone. And we do have some small gifts for the panel, which Teresa is going to distribute. Um, thank you all for coming tonight to the great debate. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have up the front here. Um, please do stay in touch with us to hear more about events coming up at UTS in 2018. Um, find the hashtag, search for everyone on Twitter. I think that's why they do it, right, for Twitter followers? And have a great night. <laughs> <laughs>